Thank you for coming. Um, this is my talk on competitive game audio, in case uh, you can't read. Um, so let's begin. Who am I and why am I here? It's missing a very important part up there because we switched it to a Mac that says my name, I think. Um, <laughs> it's not important. Uh, so uh, I made a game uh, called Sportsball. Uh, recently. It came out last November. Uh, I didn't make it by myself, of course. I made it with uh, this fine group of people over here, which I would be remiss if I didn't bring up first and foremost. Um, some of you may know or recognize Austin Montville. He is game designer extraordinaire. He did pretty much all the important things. He did the game design, the programming, the art. Uh, so he's kind of a big deal. Um, then we got Ned uh, next to him. That was our producer on the game. The music for the game was done by Nickel Punk. And then uh, the last two fellows on the side there are part of the four-man group that included also me and Austin. We called ourselves the Squawk Squad. We did a lot of balance testing and constant feedback with Austin on changes to the game so we could keep tweaking it to get it that real balanced multiplayer element that we were going for. It's a great four-player game. Uh, 2v2 is sort of the main way it's meant to be played, so Austin had a great time making it, but when he was sitting alone by himself in his room trying to balance test, it didn't really work. So he needed four of us for that, and that was something we had a lot of fun doing. Uh, like Gordy mentioned, it's on the Wii U eShop. And it's totally available in the North American region. We're going to keep working on trying to make it internationally available in the future. So that's the game. I had a bit of a hard time with this game, uh, to be honest. I had only worked on single player games before in the past. And some of you may already have some experience with that. Uh, my previous experience was like you would get a list of things that would need sounds, right? You would just get a big old spreadsheet from the developer, maybe via email or Google Documents or something, and it would just be like, oh, when the dude swings a sword, that needs a sound. When it hits something with a sword, that needs a sound. Like, when he's walking on wood, that needs a sound. You just got a big old spreadsheet of that. You make a bunch of sounds, you throw them over a wall, and you hope that they like it. Uh, and then you tweak, and, and you, you get it to the point where, where it works. But I had never considered what goes into the audio in a competitive game. It's actually pretty different. And because I had never considered it, I failed to ask myself before jumping in and getting started, what role does audio actually play in this type of game specifically? And because I failed to ask myself that, I couldn't prioritize when I started working on it. And so I made a bunch of mistakes at first. And realizing by the end of it and coming up with uh, a plan that worked, uh, that's what inspired me to make this presentation because I, I'd been to a lot of talks and I'd never really heard someone talk about the types of games that I'll be talking about today, competitive multiplayer, local multiplayer games. So I'm going to be talking a lot today about player feedback. And before I can really dig into that, it's important that we all have a basic understanding of what that means. Um, what I mean by that is mostly in and most importantly, information and direction. Uh, all developers have to work together to help players understand and learn how to play the game. You know, you may have seen YouTube videos uh, or other people talk about design and how important this is, like the Mario World 1 Level 1, how it so perfectly shows you what to do. You see an enemy and you have so much time to react to it, or like Mega Man X and how good it is at really teaching the player how to play the game so that they understand and they feel rewarded. Um, and that's a constant feedback loop between the game and the player. And that's a lot of hard work that goes into design and development to make sure that that comes across clearly. And it's important to realize that audio developers are also need to be a part of that process. So that's sort of the main crux of what I'll be talking about. Before we get into the audio part, let's talk about a lot of 
the other feedback techniques, the main one is all the visual feedback techniques. So I got a quick GIF up here of Street Fighter, which hopefully we're all at least somewhat familiar with. Um, so this is just a quick example. As a player, what does the visual feedback on here tell us? Well, pretty quickly we can tell that Ken is winning. Um, and we can tell that because there are health bars at the top, right? There's a UI, it includes a, a timer, character names, scores, points, and then there's visual effects as well that are constantly telling the player what to pay attention to. You've got the fact that there's this blue circle appearing in tells us that this is a block. It's a blocked hit. It's not actually taking damage. Um, special effects, glowing, flames. There's a lot going on. Um, and these are all sort of visual cues that tell the player what to pay attention to and give us that key information about what's going on. So now that we understand what visual feedback is, let's, let's get to the core of what we'll be talking about today. So let's listen to a classic example of an audio feedback. Oh, that did not finish. <coughs> All right, do we know what game that's from? Anybody? Sonic, Sonic thank you. Um, so this is from Sonic the Hedgehog. Do you know what that sound means? Yeah, you're drowning. Uh, so this sound would play on Sonic the Hedgehog when you're underwater, and if you, uh, it's an indication that Sonic needs air. So you would either you would either need to run into like a bubble, which he somehow breathes, or uh, surface and get out of the water. And uh, those two things would save him, and it would turn off that sound effect. But if you continued to not breathe any air, you would drown and die, uh, and lose a life. Now, it's pretty interesting because in the game, that's the only cue that tells the player that they're in trouble. There's no visual cue. I couldn't find a video of it, so just believe me. Um, yeah, you've got no flashing or like air gauge or anything like that. You just start to hear the sound. So if your TV's on mute when you're playing, uh, you would have no clue necessarily unless you just sort of had an internal understanding of how long you could do that. Um, so this is an example of audio feedback which works entirely independently of the visuals. Presumably a developer was like, uh, we don't want them to just spend all their time underwater, so there should be some way for us to tell the player that they need to surface and uh, create some tension. And a sound designer was like, oh yeah, I can do that, and they made this. Um, so that's a, that's a really good example, I think, that hopefully a lot of us can relate to or, or have heard in our past, that uh, of audio, imparting knowledge on the player and teaching them something. You can't just stay here. This is a dangerous situation for your hero, Sonic. So audio can uh, cooperate with the visuals, but it can also work independently on its own. So let's get into the competitive element. Uh, sports ball, I don't expect all of you or necessarily any of you to have played it. It, it is not uh, the biggest selling game of all time, unfortunately. Uh, that would be nice. Um, but, uh, so I'm going to try and just explain it in ways that some of you will understand. Towerfall is a very popular game which is somewhat similar uh, to the gameplay uh, mechanics that we have. So we're talking about a multiplayer game. Ours has uh, four players. The fifth person can commentate via the gamepad mic, but that's not uh, full gameplay. And um, it functions in your mind, you can think similar to Towerfall or Smash Brothers. Uh, there's lots of players sharing one screen and fighting for domination. Um, and the audio challenges were unique for this scenario. This is our game specifically, Sports Ball, as a poster we have. Uh, it's designed to be a well-balanced competitive game for four players. The original challenge was to develop a game as exciting to watch as it is to play. And uh, while working on it, Austin and I and the Squawk Squad, we, we imagined high-level tournaments during development. We considered what it would be like to play this game if you devoted hours and days and weeks of your life to it and really tried to hone in on high-level play. Would it function well or would it just get to the point where if you were super competitive, you would just know how to win and always win? We didn't want that. We wanted 
there to be a chance if you played someone at your equal level that it would be a very dramatic and intense experience. So that's, that's what went into our minds. Here is an example that I'll be showing of the gameplay. Uh, remember, this is a 2v2 action. Um, you're going to see a lot of flying birds and, and balls flying around. Uh, there's a tackle mechanic that's similar to old school joust game. You try and hit the other bird from above, and that's going to make them explode and a ball appear. And you're trying, all of them are trying to hit the ball into the red net. The first to 15 points wins. Uh, so with that little caveat, here's what it looks like. So that's kind of a final version of what the game looks and sounds like. Now, as I said, it, it came with some unique audio challenges. Um, when I took this job, it ended up that I, I learned these things. I, I had to consider the experience for each player on the couch. Um, with a single player experience, you can really hone in on your player. You can really put yourself in their point of view. But I couldn't prioritize any single player. Uh, I really had to make this across the board equal for all four players on the couch. And that was something that kept throwing me off. Uh, the audio details needed to inform the players as to what was going on. And I had to learn what aspects improved gameplay and what detracted overall. So these were the th these were sort of the challenges in front of me as I started. And uh, like any good uh, Barney Stinson, I accepted. This was kind of a breakthrough when I realized this. Uh, above all else, the player needs audio feedback to understand what is happening. This is a fast-paced game. It can be a little overwhelming at first, although it does have a pretty easy entry level. There are only two buttons that you press, um, which we were proud of. It's We were going for that easy to learn, hard to master, but it's it was pretty easy for players to lose track of their bird, to lose track of what was happening, especially if they weren't experienced gamers. And my personal goal was to help the players understand what was going on with the audio. So I said this to myself whenever I wasn't sure what direction to go in. Whenever I was starting to design a sound, whenever I tried it in game and I really liked it, but it wasn't helping, then I really had to you know, cut to the core and drop things because it wasn't helping the players understand what was happening. Um, this had to be the priority. And why is that so important? Uh, it's so important because visual focus is limited. So I want to run a, a little mind exercise for you right now. It's, it's, a, it's just a still image, but still. So many things are happening. So imagine you're controlling uh, this blue bird here on the left side. It's called the chickadee. So you're playing and you're controlling this bird. And there's a red ball at the top coming towards you. Now, if you touch that ball, the color will change to blue and you can try and hit it into the red net to score a point for your team. So in a split second when this screenshot was being taken, that's your goal, that's your focus. So visual focus is limited. You are probably only really paying attention and seeing your bird, the trajectory of that ball, and trying to hit it in just the right way to bounce it into the red net, okay? But there are so many other things happening here at the same time. On the bottom right corner, your teammate just got tackled, okay? Which is probably not good. And coming out of the net is the silhouette of another bird. That's the rooster, the teammate on, on the red team. And that bird can pop out and come right for you or go for the ball and really mess up the play that you're going for. So these are things that you may not absorb with just your eyes in the split second when this is happening. So the reason this is so important is because our ears don't blink. Our ears don't have the same uh, limits that our eyes do, absorbing all that information. So even though you can't necessarily look at and see what's happening on the bottom right corner of the screen while also trying to make this shot. You can hear the sound effect of your friend or your teammate getting tackled and react to that information. You can hear the sound of 
the red bird spawning out of the net and realize, ooh, I may need to actually fly higher up to avoid getting tackled or maybe loop around and come from the other side so that I do something a little bit different and change your strategy. So let's go into some examples of the sounds in sports ball that I ended up going with to help with this problem of gameplay. We're starting with the action sounds because those did end up being the most important in game. Straight from my DAW, the flap sound. And here's what it looks like in game in the engine with all the reverb and stuff. Um, we did this in engine with uh, recording it with fraps and um, turning the music off in the settings in game. So it's not the highest quality, but it is actually gameplay sound. This is the diving sound effect. One more time. And in game. My goals with these two sounds was clarity. Uh, I wanted to add weight to them so that they felt rewarding, and I really had to consider repetition. These are the only two buttons in the game. They're being pressed constantly. Uh, at one point, I attempted uh, unique flap and dive sounds for each bird. There are 16 birds in the game, but it proved too confusing because they are constantly being played, and it just overwhelmed the players, and it overwhelmed me when I tried it. So one flap sound, one dive sound, that ended up being necessary. Uh, footsteps. This is what it sounds like from the DAW. And in game. Um, there's not actually a lot of running in the game. Most of the action happens in the air, but uh, it still was important. I tried to keep it short and crisp so that, uh, once again, just uh, clear. This is sort of the, when we get into a little bit of the meat. Uh, tackle sounds. So here is the sound of the cockatoo being tackled. So, yeah, it was actually a person, believe it or not, uh, <laughs> making that sound. All right, so that's the sound of the cockatoo's sort of strangled cry as it gets tackled. And then uh, as it starts to respawn out of the net, there's a, a warm up. That's kind of a countdown. And then the actual sound as it spawns out of the net. Now there's a little bit of distortion on these speakers, but uh, take my word for it. And all of that together looks like this. So you can see it, you can see it in effect. Now the tackle sounds are unique to each bird. And this was not a problem, because unlike the flap and dive, they're not happening constantly. And also, it was more informative, because if you learn the sound of your teammate getting tackled, and or the sound of your bird getting tackled, and you lost track of yourself for whatever reason, or you're looking somewhere else and then you heard it, you're like, oh, I got taken out. And it's not the end of the world in the game, that doesn't cause points in the main game mode that we have. So unique tackle sounds did prove useful and fun. The Warm-up sound as you're about to come out and the respawn sound were also very crucial. I'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, scoring, what does it sound like when you actually get a ball in the net? That's from my DAW. And in-game. So with uh, scoring, after talking to Austin about it, we we wanted it to have weight uh, to help guide and direct player attention, but at the same time, it, it couldn't be overwhelming. Uh, we focused on the lower end of the frequency range that we were going with to contrast the other higher pitched action sounds that were happening. And that hopefully gave it a real sense of like you accomplished something and also helped it to stand out to the player when they heard it because you want to direct their attention to, oh, something just went in the net. Oh, you should probably also check the scoreboard and, and things like that. Uh, we also have power-ups in the game. These weren't in the main mode that uh, most people would play. So in our competitive mode called Sports Ball Pro, it's just uh, 2v2 
and uh, no power ups, first to 15 points wins, maximum of four balls on the field. Uh, but we did have some more hectic modes, including explosive chaos, uh, which had these uh, bomb balls in play. So the sound of you uh, getting the power up was uh, pretty straightforward. And here's what it looks like when you do get that. It's kind of exactly the same, actually. And, um, and it also had this great visual feedback that Austin put in with the black smoke uh, trailing your bird now so that people on the screen could tell that who had got it and who was who currently had that power-up equipped. Now, the bombs have a kind of countdown element. They basically work as proximity mines. So while they're in play and their physics are exactly the same as a regular ball, if they get converted uh, three times by touching different uh, teams, then on the third touch, they explode. So here is the sound of the, pow the bomb ball being created. And then the first conversion, and then the second conversion, and now it's armed. So that's why I went with this double beep. And it will also flash in game when that happens. And then the final beep and explosion. And this is a bit of a silly video. I was controlling uh, both birds, so bear with it. Uh, here it is. So those were the action sounds, like I said, very very crucial to what we were going for. Uh, then we were, we were able to kind of get to a bit of the fun stuff. We had audio backdrops with the crowd system in place. It, it, it provided excitement and immersion for the player. We had uh, you know some levels of excitement and cheering. Yeah! We had um, different sounds that would react to what was being done on the field. And we had uh, various chants that the crowd could go into. Most of the chants are actually uh, the crowd cheering the name of the team that is uh, dominating at that particular moment. But um, we decided to record that, and we weren't sure what we were going to use it for. And then Austin came up with the idea of when both teams are at match point, so 14 and 14, the crowd would start chanting, live by the bird, die by the bird, and uh, next point would win. And this doesn't happen that often in the game, but when it does, it's, it's very exciting. Um, <laughs> so here's just a quick example. Very quick. So it's, that's just the crowd reacting to the near miss shot. If you, if you do sound design in any capacity, uh, you're a creative person, right? You, you have to come up with uh, creative concepts and ideas to go into the game. And in a way, we're, we're kind of artists. And you want, those, uh, you want those sounds that you feel are you're really proud of, right? Those, uh, those ones that have so many layers or, or that you got a really cool concept and you manage to make something you're really proud of. Um, now, a lot of those action sounds are actually pretty simple, and it was hard for me to uh, really delve into them. But uh, my recommendation if you're making any game like this is, if, is find the dramatic opportunities in the game. The, if you find the drama, that's, that's the opportunity for more detailed audio. And it can really draw the players in. This video I'm going to show you shows our slow motion system, which was one of my favorite parts of working on this game as a sound designer. Um, so just to give you a little context again for people who don't know how the game works, uh, it shows the Sapphire Sky Hearts uh, battling the red hot team. So the blue team only needs one more point to win, while the red team is doing everything they can to stay in the game. Uh, focus on the action around the red net, it's going to be on the left side, and um, this slow motion basically goes into effect when a shot is on trajectory or close to going into the net, the final shot that would win. So this is what it looks like.
so um, there's a lot going on there. Uh, the slow motion system itself included a low pass filter, uh, a looping heartbeat sound, and audience reactions sort of ramping up. And when the, when the shot was either blocked or uh, actually goes into the net, you hear a reaction one way or the other from the audience as it snaps back into real time. So we spent a lot of time on that trying to make it feel uh, really juicy and, and fun for the players. So that was probably one of the elements that I could be most proud of and really honing in and, and nailing it in that regard. Something a bit more challenging. Why do we have to do all this in a game, in a competitive game? Well, <clears throat> you have to think about what kind of people are going to play your game, right? What, you're, you're going for replayability with something like this. This isn't an adventure game per se. It's not something where you know, you've made 30 hours of content, single player sits down, plays that adventure for 30 hours, and then it's done. Maybe they do a new game plus if they really loved it or something along the lines. You're going for, this is a system, and sit down, play with your friends, and do it over and over and over and over again. And with that in mind, you know, you're going to have to cater to different types of players, especially the competitive players, because they're the ones who will champion your game. Competitive players want to keep improving to gain any advantage possible. That's just the nature of what it means to be competitive. With sharp audio cues, experienced players can respond to changes instinctively, reflexively. So you're basically teaching them with the sharp audio cues what each thing means. And then it gets embedded in their brain in some way, and they know what to do with that. So when they hear the sound of, oh, bird spawned, watch out around the net. Oh, um, my teammate just got tackled. I got to play a little defensively till he comes back. You know, things like that. You're, if you allow that to get muddled, if you don't make each sound unique and clear and come through in the mix, they're not going to learn and it's not going to feel nearly as rewarding on their 500th playthrough when they're like, I don't know when that happens. And, you know, oh, that bugs me, right? So that's what you really, that's why this is important. You, you're giving them the tools to keep improving, to gain as much knowledge and understanding of what's happening so that they can predict what's going to happen in the next few seconds if you're truly an experienced player of, of the game. That's why one of the reasons why I spent so much time working on this with Austin, our developer. Audio reminds the players to pay attention. It directs their focus. And at the same time, we have the added goal and, and difficulty of trying to make each tackle and each point feel great, uh, to keep working on the audio until it does feel great. Because every time you get that final point in, it should feel rewarding. You should feel like standing up and cheering. So those were sort of the biggest goals. This is what implementation looked like uh, in Unity. Super fun. <laughs> uh, next, I, I told Austin that I hope we have enough money next time for WISE or something along the lines, because it was not fun. Um, but still, uh, we made it work. Uh, some things that I learned that I did this time around, which I would recommend, to, uh, to my coworkers and, and, and fellow audio creators. Uh, I spoke with the composer ahead of time when we both had a, a working knowledge of what we were going for. This was so helpful. I was able to play some of the rough sounds that I had. He was able to play some of the tracks he had already um, pretty much completed for the game. And we were able to talk to each other about the frequency ranges we were going for, the concepts, the tone, and really work together to make sure that we weren't stepping on each other's toes, that we weren't clashing in the audio soundscape of what would be happening overall in the game. So he was able to listen to some of my sounds and realize that, oh, this, um, this instrument in the track is actually uh, clashing with it, You know, some hi-hat, for example, and he took it out. And the song still worked super well. Uh, you know, that's Nickel Punk doing a great job on composing the game. But at the same time, it, it was to both of our benefits. It, the overall experience is better for it. 
when we were able to talk to each other and I was able to hear what the music would sound like before it was finalized so I could also tweak things on my end. It goes both ways um, and it's something I highly recommend if possible. Some of you may be composers and sound designers at the same time so that's something you can have an internal discussion with yourself about but for those of you like me who are uh, just a sound designer working with a composer, I highly recommend uh, talking to each other when you have some rough ideas already laid out. Volume levels, I, I worked, I was pretty much responsible for the mix, working with Austin, the finalized mix, including the music. Uh, the action sounds had to have number one priority, and that meant they had to have, be prioritized in the volume mix as well. Uh, at first, the music was, uh, was dominating, mostly because uh, Nickel Punk was delivering music files at a much higher decibel level than I was delivering mine. So I had to go back and equalize and send back again. And then we tweaked until you were really able to pick out each sound as it was happening. And like I said, the action one specifically, not the crowd, not the, not the nice immersion stuff that we, we were very proud of. Those had to be in the background, it had to be audible, but you know you couldn't ever put them front and center in the mix. And uh, some real stress testing had to go into this at the same time. What happens if everyone flaps at exactly the same moment? You have to ask yourself questions like that in a multiplayer game. What happens if everyone dives at exactly the same time? Does it sound like crap? <laughs> That's a real possibility. You have to limit, you have to tweak, you may have to even go back to the drawing board uh, to a certain extent to your DAW and, and try to change it so that with, with the knowledge that if these sounds occur very rapidly one after another, does it sound like total garbage? <laughs> and if it does, that's a real problem. And you have to be willing to go back and fix that. One way I recommend that is actually going in your DAW and queuing up the sound in either, you know, in multiple tracks maybe so it occurs every like half second or split second and just hear eight of them in a row. Do -do 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 -do. Does that sound horrifying or is that okay? Oh yeah, sounds like eight flaps. All right, cool, put it in. You know, that's, that's important. Um, and see your audio through to the end. Don't just deliver a bunch. I mean, this is ideal. I had a lot of great benefits and I recognize that. Austin Montville is a great developer and designer. He's also a friend of mine. We were in the same area. Nickel Punk was in the same area. We could sit down, we could have these conversations. A lot of you in indie world don't have that luxury. You're working with people thousands of miles away. You've got to just get an email with a spreadsheet, make those sounds, send them back. But really try your best, I guess, is all I can say. This one was hard. Know when to stop. Uh, <laughs> Like I said, I'm a creative type. I wanted to sink my teeth into this. I really, this was one of the, the, this is the first console game I'd ever made. And I knew that, and I knew it was gonna get shipped. I knew it was gonna release. And I was very proud of this moment. And I wanted to show the world what I could do. And so it was so tempting to just make more. Oh, Austin, what if I did this? What if I added more variation? What if there were like 30 flap sounds and like a random container and every time someone flapped, it sounded like potentially totally different. And oh, what if I did this? And I did, I actually made a lot of stuff that never made it into the game because whenever we tried some of these things and we put them in, the feedback got muddled. And we would play it and I'd be like, I didn't even know that that was happening across the screen. We play this game a lot. So I quickly realized I'm, I'm just messing it up. I'm, <laughs> I'm literally doing too much and it is messing up the game experience. And that sucked. So I just had to step back and really pick very carefully my battles. I would just, and this wasn't even Austin, this wasn't anyone else telling me what to do. This was me being critical of my own work and looking at it and being like, we could do that. We, I could just put like one thing there and that would, be, that would be cool. I think that would work. And I would try it and I would be honest with myself and I would say, yes, that worked or no, that was shit. And why was it shit? Uh, well, my sound is actually pretty good, but it just doesn't work, okay. Well, then take it out, leave it the way it was, or maybe it shouldn't have a sound. We tried, every time the ball bounced on a surface, we tried to make a sound for that, I did. So every time the ball ricocheted off a wall, or on the floor, or off a platform, yeah, that could make a sound. Horrible idea. 
you can play the game with like 20 balls in play. It sounded like garbage. It was like, you know, potentially hundreds of ricochets in five seconds. And you couldn't pick anything else out. And it didn't matter how many variations I put in, that would have been a disaster. That's an example. And so we just stuck with the one thing. When your bird hits the ball, it makes a sound. The other ricochets are, are quiet. There's too much going on. Um, you have to know when to stop. Seeing people play and enjoy sports ball uh, has been a real pleasure for me and also a huge learning experience. So uh, this photo was taken at Indycade last year. We held a sports ball tournament and it was awesome. Uh, many indie sound designers uh, deliver content and they don't actually get to hear the final implementation of what it's like in the game unless they get like a free copy of it after it comes out. And I think that's a real shame. Even larger companies, if you're uh, blessed enough to work at a big AAA studio, you know, you've got QA to kind of take care of the, the listening part once it's in. And, and that's great. You've got to delegate. We, none of us can do everything all at the same time. But um, I learned so much by playing the game and watching people play the game that I really uh, can't recommend that enough, especially for a competitive multiplayer game like this. Because at the end of the day, uh, only you as the creator know if the audio is functioning exactly as it's intended. If you think about that, you're really the only person who knows, right? Because uh, let's say you've got QA, right? Let's say you're, you've got that luxury. And QA will tell you if an, a sound's not triggering, right? If, if you give them the right information and they're good at their job, they'll tell you like, oh yeah, you know, you tackle the bird and it doesn't play anything, right? That's, that's a good catch, thank you. Fix that, great. What if the sound is playing, but it's, it's actually not, this, not the right file? So like, let's say it's a gun in a game and you know that you made a sound for the shotgun and a sound for an SMG or whatever, and it's actually playing the SMG sound every time the shotgun fires. Well, maybe QA didn't know that because why would QA know that, right? So it goes through. All right, well, whose fault is that? I mean, I'm not trying to lay any blame in, on anyone or anything, but like, you're, you would be the one to figure that out. You would be the one to hear that and go, that's not a shotgun. <laughs> I know what the shotgun sounds like. I made it. <laughs> and you could be the one to fix that. Um, an example of, of something that happened in sports ball is uh, the respawn sound. That uh, the sound as it actually comes out of the net is that da -da, that uh, sort of uh, beepy sound. The programming was set up such that if multiple birds were spawning right after one another, only the, only the first bird would get that sound effect because the programming was set up that it wouldn't actually uh, overplay. It wouldn't cue up or trigger the sound if it was still being played. So the first one would get the nice da -da, and then the second and possibly third one would come out in total silence. I don't know how many hours I played the game before I realized that that was happening. But I did. I caught it one time. I was, I thought, uh, I thought we were, we had tackled both of our opponents. We had this free time where they weren't even around and we were trying to score. I heard the sound, so I knew one of them was back on the field. And then when I looked over, both of them were back on the field. And I was like, what the hell? And we watched the replay and I was like, Austin, it's only playing once. And he was like, oh, is that not how you intended it to work? I was like, no, I specifically made that sound so that it would sound good if it was played repeatedly, very quickly, and also so that it would clearly tell the player how many birds just came out of the net. Da -na 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 -na. That's three birds, right? And that made sense. It was very easy for me and Austin to go back and to fix that little bug, and it worked the way I intended it to. No one else would have heard that or seen that or noticed that. That's sort of an example of what I'm talking about. Being, if you really try your best, even those of us who are delivering sounds to a team we don't even get to meet face to face, to actually play the builds of the game and to talk to them about how they're being implemented, the mix, how it's intended to work, and not just here's a sound, uh, I highly recommend that. And those of us in, in bigger companies uh, with, uh, with a huge budget, yeah, in your spare time, 
whenever you get the chance, you know, we all need to rest our ears sometimes and we can't all be creative geniuses 24 seven, you know, just try it out. Be like, hey, I, that's that one sound I was super proud of. I wanna see if it's working the way I really wanted it to, you know? <clears throat> In the end, I'll leave you uh, with this. Uh, this is sort of the main thing that I came away with. And I, I had to use the greater than symbol, but that's not really what I mean. Um, I mean before. So clarity before emotion, before immersion. And, and this is how I believe competitive games need to be prioritized when it comes to the audio. Uh, first and foremost, uh, consider how your audio can actually improve gameplay and never underestimate the potential value of your contributions in sound. Um, if you pay attention to the gameplay mechanics, you can actually help guide the player's attention to whatever is most important. So you can literally ask yourself that, is it possible that audio could address a design struggle in your own project? Games are unique in that they are interactive. Players are doing things. And what, at the end of the day, what makes a game functional and great are the mechanics. And audio has a real effect on that. Audio can fully improve or take away from those mechanics. Not just in feeling, not just in the emotion. Those things are so important. I know that. I'm not trying to detract from like beautiful scores of emotional music or you know poignant sound effects or gore or like whatever it is that just really adds impact to it. That's those are the second things, the second and third things. Absolutely super important. But feedback and mechanics, that's what actually makes the game work. And if you figure out what the designers are going for, what the mechanics of the game are going to be, and where they're struggling, like the players aren't really getting that they need to go over here, or they aren't really getting that when the zombies are, are like coming at you from behind, we don't really have any way of like showing them that. We don't want to put like a mini map because that would be distracting and stuff. You'd be like, I can, I can help with that. Zombies coming from behind you? Yeah, I can. I can totally make some cool sounds and like chattering or whatever, and and we can pan it and and you know if they've got surround sound, it could literally be coming out of their back speakers, and if they don't, you know we can just pan it really far back, and you know you can come up with stuff. You could potentially solve design struggles, and I feel like a lot of audio people don't realize that. Um, I was very lucky with having that sort of constant back and forth with our developer, that uh, and and watching people play our games, that I, I really took on some of those goals. Sportsball uh, has a lot of positive reviews online, uh, and almost no one mentioned the sound design. <laughs> uh, I didn't really get any praise or criticism, which I was pretty hungry for, because like I said, it was my first uh, console game. Uh, and for a while, I was, didn't really know what to do about that or how to feel. And, and then I decided uh, that in a way, uh, that could, I could take that as a victory. Um, maybe I had tied the audio so closely with the gameplay that it didn't stand out on its own. Um, so instead, I could take some small credit when a reviewer described the game as frantic fun or something along those lines. At least that's what I told myself. So I'm going to go with that. <laughs> Don't tell me otherwise. Um, I'm Kareem Schumann. That's a picture of my awesome dog. And uh, I'm a sound designer. I'm a lot of things. But um, that's what I consider myself to be. Do you have any questions, you guys? That's it. <laughs>
and then talk about it. And that iteration process was what gave me sort of the most insight into how the sounds were actually being implemented by Austin. So, you know, he he absolutely had a lot of feedback to give me. He, most of it was his own personal taste. So it'd be, I would give him 10 sounds and he'd be like, all right, I like eight of these, these two, uh, I don't I don't really like them. I put them in for now, just so you could see how they work, but I would prefer something that sounded totally different. And that's fine. I would go back and I would work with him on that and I would give him a few different options and he would pick which one he liked. That that was sort of his input in the audio. He would he would make sure it worked. And then I would actually play the build of it with those sounds implemented and tell him what I thought of it. And then towards the end of the game design and development, I actually sat down with him several times and went through the mix, which was a different process entirely, mostly through that uh, screenshot of Unity that I showed where we went in and we really sort of went, okay, I can't hear this sound at all. We need to push that up. Um, this isn't nearly as important as it is loud, so turn that down and that kind of thing. So that was, that was the back and forth Austin and I had. And like I said, he did pretty much everything by himself. So <laughs> it was not a team of people. It was just the two of us. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. So um, you also gave away the responsibility for randomizing and, and, and that kind of stuff. Like you said, you had pitch randomization. Would yeah. you give him a sound and he would kind of figure out what to do with it? Um, the, the pitch shifting and, and randomization and, and variations in that regard were doable in the through the um, through the plugin for Unity. So I was able to do that myself once we sat down with the with the system. Um, that wasn't done until sort of the last two months of development. After everything was already in place and we knew it was working, then we kind of went in and, and made it made it shine. Um, yeah. But he would he didn't know how to do that. So no, he wouldn't that wouldn't have worked. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you mentioned you have a pretty hard time, not difficult time mm. working with slow mode. So uh, I wanted to hear more about how you figured out how, like, is that design um, problem or it's more about implementation? Um, yeah, I mean, maybe I didn't pick the best word, uh, word for that. It, it wasn't necessarily super difficult as it was, uh, as it allowed a lot more detail, which gave me more work to do. But uh, but I didn't find it uh, particularly like in, in a, an impossible challenge or something along those lines. We the the slowdown effect was someone's idea. I think a player that played the game talked about how they wanted they want they couldn't react sometimes quickly enough when a final ball was going in, and they didn't even realize it was the last shot. So they threw out a few ideas, and one of them was slow mo. And one thing that Austin does whenever someone throws out an idea that he thinks is horrible, is he'll actually implement it to prove them wrong. And several times it turns out that they're 100% right. And then he's just like, yep, he'll take credit for it. That was, that was my idea. <laughs> no, uh, he's great, but he'll fully admit it. Um, for example, diving in the game. He wanted it to be more like the original Joust with just flapping. And someone was like, it's pretty slow. I feel like you should put a dive button in. He's like, that's a horrible idea. Totally ruined the game, puts it in makes it amazing. So, um, so slow-mo was a suggestion. He, he did try it and we really liked it. It turns out to be very important in a lot of ways. As soon as he showed it to me, I had like 10 ideas for what I wanted to do with it. I was like, oh, oh, like low pass filter and, and like breathing or heartbeat and like we could have, we could cue it with the programming and I talked to him about, I was like, is this possible where we could make sure that there was an audience reaction that occurred as soon as the slow-mo snapped back? And he was like, yeah, we can make sure it does that. And so I just iterated him with like 10 different ideas and then I delivered them to him. And once we put it in, we just kind of took away the stuff that didn't work and expanded the stuff that did work. and. It was great. So it was, I'd say overall, it, it took about two to three weeks to get it where we really wanted it to. Um, I just, I found that to be a really exciting part of the process because like I was saying, the, the dramatic opportunities were also audio opportunities. And that's where you really get to, to dig in to the sound design element. Yeah. Anybody else? 
No, I think that's it. So thank you so much, you guys. This was my uh, this was my first industry talk uh, anywhere. So I want to say a big thank you to uh, my Vancouver brethren for uh, inviting me up to the Great White North. And um, if you guys are ever in Seattle, we have a great uh, game audio meet up there as well that tends to happen about once a month. Um, so if you want to hear about that or, or talk to me about anything else, uh, come find me once this is over and I'd be happy to give out my information. You can also email me uh, if you like. So thank you. Have a good night.